excited for today. Very excited because I would like because today I'm gonna explain my work in a simple words. I'm gonna explain you know mathematics without using any formula, so it's something that is very challenging. So you know, I would like to thank you for for this opportunity. As as you can see, as, as you can see here, my, the, main, the, main, the main idea of today is to, to, to justify, to explain why I fell in love with symmetries five years ago. Why is in physics symmetries are so important? Because when we think about symmetries, somehow we are thinking that we have a tool, somehow that we can use, use it to simplify the problem. Of course, it's, it's like this, but they are more than that. They actually, symmetries can help us to understand the structure of the universe, the structure of what is around us. If there is a connection between symmetries and what is called the conservation laws, conservation laws. So let me explain uh, what, is a, what is a conservation law with a funny analogy. And to do so, let me, let me ask you something. So how many times have we used cheat codes or cheats in video games to get through a mission? Now I'm thinking about Tom Ryder. Tom Ryder was a PlayStation 1 video game, and when I was a kid, it was completely impossible, completely impossible to get through it without using cheat codes. You know, I use I use cheat codes, you know, to to get or to to, to solve that puzzle in an easy way. So the what are the cheat? But honestly, honestly, I'm still doing it. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so the question is, what are the cheat codes in physics? So the cheat codes in physics are the conservation. Okay, because they allow us to solve complicated or impossible problems. So we have a problem in physics, and then we use we go to, the, to, to that book where the cheat codes are, and then we try to use them in order to simplify my problems and to get a solution easier in an easy way. So let me put an example of that. Imagine that we are in, a, in an exam, two boys, of course, of exercise, and then the exam has this question. Imagine that we have an inclined plane with no friction, with a sphere placed on the, on the top of the plane, the inclined plane. One question could be, what is the final velocity? Of course, because I am a good student, always with a monster and a high, <laughs> always, I try, I start you not know, thinking about this problem. Okay, and then of course you know this kind of problem has to be solved with an angle, with an angle of you know of, uh, of inclination. I have to introduce that input that my my plane doesn't have friction. This is an important point. And then I place the sphere, and then what I want, to flip, what I really want is well, what I what I have to, to know is the distance between the center of the of the sphere at the edge of the at the edge of the of the plane. <laughs> Okay, because I studied so hard, so so I studied so much, I know that there are, there are two options to solve this problem. The third option is the, using the Newton's law. Newton's law gives us uh, information about the equation of motion of this sphere. But of course, look that this equation involves vectors, and honestly, vectors are some, somehow are you know difficult to, to handle it. Apart from that, we have to solve a second differential equation. That is always, is, is always a difficult thing. For this reason, we have another, we have another thing to, we have another tool to, to solve this problem. And what, the other thing is energy conservation, a conservation law. Because we, because we don't have friction, we can use, we can use the idea that the energy of the total system is conserved. In other words, what it means. Is that we have a, the energy of the sphere on the top of the plane is exactly the same that at the end of the plane. So we can use this, this uh, tool in order to solve this problem in an easier way. Okay? So these are you know examples of why you know cheap or why energy why conservation laws in this case are for me like cheap laws because it is somehow, somehow is a way to solve problems in an easier way, like Tom Ryder. Uh, yes, uh, so but rather, okay, yes, but rather than being cheat codes, they are closer to, to the nature source code because they arise from a more fundamental concept that are symmetries. There is a connection between symmetries and conservation laws. 
And this idea came from Emily Nether. Emily Nether was a mathematician, not a physicist, in the 20s. Okay, that she was considered by Albert Einstein, Felix Klein, and David Hilbert, one of the most brilliant minds at that time. So imagine the letter. Imagine it. She, 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 uh, her idea was that the conservation of laws derive from a more fundamental relationship, and this relationship is related with the, with the fact that we have symmetries in our, in our nature. And this idea is encapsulated in what is called the Nether theorem. So let me explain the Nether theorem, uh, or let me say what Nether theorem says. Okay, so for every continuous, continuous symmetry, there exists a conserved quantity. It's a very powerful thing. Because uh, for every continuous thing, for every continuous symmetry, we, we have something that is conserved. So we're very powerful in physics. So let's unpack this question. Uh, let me, let's unpack this sentence. Well, first of all, what is a symmetry? Symmetry is an operation that we can perform to an object that leaves it completely unchanged. So let me put an example of that. Imagine that we take the square, okay, and then we level the corner of the square by one, two, three, and four. And then we now apply a transformation, an operation, okay? And that tra transformation operation are, so is a uh, 90 degree rotation. Of course, we apply this transformation, we realize that, of course, the shape of the, of the square doesn't change. However, so for this case, we have a symmetry, this kind of, this kind of transformation can be related with a symmetry. However, however, if we apply 40 degrees rotation, we see that the shape change. So for this case, for the particular degrees uh, of rotation, we don't have symmetry. So let's focus on another example. Let's focus on, the, on, the, on, a, on, a, on a snowflake, and we are going to focus on, the, on this specific region. This particle, you know, that is colored by, by particle. Then, as, I, as we did before, uh, we apply degree rotation to see that, in fact, if we focus on the shape of the dot point, this part of the of the of the, of the, the snowflake, we see that the shape is exactly the same. So for this particular case, we have symmetry on operations that, that we can that we, we can be, uh, we can relate it uh, with, uh, with the symmetry. As before, we apply, for example, 90 degrees, we see that in fact we don't have symmetry because this region is not exactly the same as the previous one. So perfect. So of course, the, these two are not symmetries, but these two, yes. So for this case, because we are working with a specific angle of rotation, we call these symmetries are discrete symmetries. So, but I would like to remind you here that in the, in the Nether theorem, what is involved uh, is the continuous symmetry. So we have to go farther than the discrete symmetries. So let me put an example of that. So imagine that we take this sphere. Now look that this sphere is invariant. It's, uh, it's, it's completely invariant for any angle of rotation that we can apply. Any angle, we can take whatever. Um, and for this kind of symmetries, it's what is called continuous symmetries, because it works for any uh, kind, for any degree of rotation that we can apply to, to it. So this is, this is exactly this kind of symmetries and what are involved, so the kind of symmetries are what are involved exactly to the to the nether effect. So let me, let me you know, uh, explain the consequences of the another term with two theoretical examples. Okay? The first example is, consider now that we have a rope. Okay, but this rope has two, two features. The first feature is, uh, it has to be infinite. Okay? We are, of course, as I said before, we are in a theoretical, theoretical uh, example. And this road, it has the same pattern along all the this infinite road. So then I, I, you know, I move my Ferrari because it's something that I can I, I can afford uh, by by my salary at the University of Barcelona, and then I drive the Ferrari there. Okay, and then of course I move once it's placed there. I move my, my car, you know, at this and this. This and this this kind of transformation is called space transformation. Then, because it's infinite, the road is infinite, and we have the same pattern, the picture doesn't change if I move my car. Of course, we can apply another transformation, another space transformation, and then the picture remains invariant. So, this theoretical example, what we try to say, 
is that it's invariant under space translation. And doesn't matter how, uh, how long we, we move our car. It's a, it's a continuous symmetry, and if we plug this symmetry, this continuous symmetry, into the middle theorem, what it's telling, what it's telling us is that the, what is concerned in this case is the momentum. And this is most, the most important thing about this one that I would like to, 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 to highlight is that it's proven rigorously. Rigorously. I mean, there is not like a conjecture. It's not like, I think that maybe, or maybe we can, you know, it's proven you know, mathematically rigorous. This is outstanding. Okay? And of course, then the, you know, the proof is super easy. I mean, it's super easy. It's, it's, not, it's not very hard. Okay, so let's go to the so let's move to the to the to the to the, to the second example, and then we we consider that we have this. Okay, this is my uh, this is my girlfriend. Okay, now I think it's going on fifteen minutes. And the presentation and now is <laughs> no, she has seen it before. <laughs> Uh, yes, yeah, so let me consider that we, have, uh, we are in Pisa, and then we are, of course, we are in Pisa, we, we have to visit the Pisa Tower. Yeah, uh, let me. Um, then, the, this, uh, then I take two, two football balls, I, I take two, these two football balls, put, I put it on my, inside of my back, I put it on my shoulders, and then I start climbing up all the stairs. Well, once I hit one side on the top, uh, I try to make an experiment. And this experiment is, 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 is uh, as simple as I'm going to throw a ball in order to correct it, in order to see if gravity is correct. Of course, if I do it for the one of the ball, the gravity is telling us that the, you know, the, the ball falls down. But we, okay, I don't believe it. I'm going to wait you know, two, two minutes more, one hour more, but whenever. And then I did a second more in order to verify that the results are correct. Of course, I throw it again, again, and then, uh, then of course, the, the, the word falls down. Um, because I don't believe it either, I'm going to wait two days, three days, four days more, and then I do, this, I make the same experiment. And of course, you know, the word is going to fall down. So this theoretical example, what he's trying to say is that it's invariant and the time translation. It doesn't, make, it doesn't matter where I make the experiment, how long I take to, to, to make the experiment. It's always happening the same way. So it's a very it's invariant on the time translation, which is a continuous symmetry. If we plug this continuous symmetry into the nether theorem, what we obtain, if what is conserved, is the energy. You will also. Okay? So, so let's go back to the to that, to, to that example, now look that this example, then no matter when I can read it, it's always happening in the same way. So this, in fact, is invariant in the time translation. This is why, from a mathematical point of view, somehow we can justify that we can use the energy conservation. So it's super powerful, this theorem. So when I, when I think about the other thing, I think about somehow a shame. Okay, because imagine that we take your translational invariant is the first example, and then I apply this symmetry, continuous symmetry, into that machine. Then I turn it on, I see the machine is starting working out, and we, what we obtain is the momentum conservation. Now, if we take, for example, another symmetry, time invariance, okay, um, we plug this time invariant, this continuous symmetry, into the middle of them, and what we obtain is the energy conservation. But we can go further, we can go uh, to another you know, symmetries. For example, rotational invariance. Rotational invariance, we can apply this, we can apply this symmetry into that theorem, and what we obtain is the angular momentum. So it's crazy. I mean, it's understandable. Because that, 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 it doesn't matter how continue, what is the continuous symmetry. I know that if I have it in my theory, I always have uh, a conservation law. It's very powerful for a mathematical point of view. But we can go to the more complex, more complex symmetries. We can go to the quantum ball. If we want to the quantum mechanics, for example, if we want to describe an electron, this electron is, you know, is, uh, is uh, described by a complex function. This complex, flux, uh, this complex function is always invariant under a rotational phase. 
these are you know somehow complex symmetry uh, uh, where the quantum ball is involved. If I take the symmetry and plug this into another theory, what we obtain is that what is conserved is electric charge. So it's very powerful because this is telling us that the charge of the electron is always the same. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't, it, it doesn't change. You know, it's, it's, it, it's, it's, it's exactly the same along the entire direction. So it's crazy. It's crazy. So somehow the other theory, the symmetry, is giving us information about how the structure is our world. It's why I fell in love with symmetry when I was 35 years ago, more or less. It was crazy. Crazy. Because apart from that, it works for any scale that we are. Because, for example, in this case, we are working with a, with a microscopic uh, wall, but we can go to the large scales. We can go, for example, to the cosmos, to the standard universe, how the universe is far. This is And this theory works. It's amazing. It's amazing. Okay, so the conclusions are obviously uh, symmetries. I used to simplify problem, this is for sure. Okay? But symmetry, the symmetries are used for more than that. They help us to understand the structure of the nature. And one of the examples is, for example, to understand that the charge of the electron is conserved along the time, along the, along the, all the time. Con or conservation law, of course. And, you know, and this, this link between symmetries, continuous symmetries in particular, and conservation laws is through uh, another theorem. So, this is the main idea, and this is why you know I you know uh, cultivated by the Nether theorem. So as far as I am concerned, or as far as I know, you know the Nether theorem is practically perfect. I mean, they, they, there were so many people working on that, trying to you know to squeeze it so in, in different ways and whatever. So the question is, what is my research here? Is so important? Is so is so perfect? Because we realize, prof my professor Jones and myself, that this, if we move, if we walk, so if we go to the to the details of the proof, then this is the third for me, in my opinion. Uh, all uh, is only proof, uh, is only proof for local operators. What is a local operator? For example, a derivative. Always for the derivatives. What if you know? What if they involve if these theories involve several different operators or integral integral Integral, it's integral differential operators. Because now the modern physics requires these exotic operators. Because I know that people are working on, uh, on this exotic, uh, this exotic theory, for example, to, to solve the Big Bang singularity, the black hole singularity, in order uh, uh, sorry, through, these, through these integral differential operators. Okay, so the question is imagine that our, you know, our nature can be described as these exotic theories. We can apply these theories, you know, like we can apply these theories or the similar theories into the another theorem. And the answer is no. And the answer is no, because it's all this proof always for local operators, not for non local ones. So the question is, the question is, you know, this is, came up very, very fast. So it comes, comes, comes up very fast because, of course, it's so powerful. We need to study it. And we achieve it. This is more. This is why I'm very excited for this because we achieved it, and this uh, and we don't in these three articles. These three articles are published in mathematical and physical journal, and we are very happy because we know that people currently are using it to understand, for example, string theory and modified theories of gravity. So we are very happy for that. And with that, I can, I finish my talk. You know, very fast, very well, as, far as I consider the most clear, with a use it any formula as I promise. And uh, yes, of course. So if you have any question, please go ahead. The question can be in Spanish, Catalan, or English. Okay, non German, because in German I understand it. But, uh, but yes, yeah, pardon. Mark. Yeah, I was just wondering about the uh, Sí, pero Andreo tiene una pregunta. Adelante, por favor. Obre, obre la cuba, ¿no? No, eso se ha levantado. Ah, sí, sí, sí. Hola, buenas tardes, Carlos. Hola, buenas tardes. Buena uh, primero de todo, felicitarte por la propuesta de, de tema. Uh, sí, gracias. Molt. 
Eh, me escarré porque cuando mmm, estaba acabando el meu doctorat, sí. eh, la, meva, la meva tesi, cuando estaba acabando el sí. meu tesi, eh, sí. va a un vídeo sí. que abocaba justamente a los mateixos temas que tú has explicado hoy sobre el tema de, el teorema de Emil Nether. Sí. Y eh, em va a dar mucho para la elegancia de, de plantejament. Sí, Pero sí. em vaig quedar amb la mateixa pregunta que me em quedo hoy. Sí. Te voy a aprovechar para hacer la pregunta. ¿Cómo es deriva o cómo es troba quién es la cantidad que se conserva a partir de una determinada simetría? Sí, vale. Sí, vale. Eso es una bueno. primera pregunta. Y la segunda pregunta sí. es una pregunta doble, seu torn, que es: ¿es pot derivar del teorema de Mineter al principio de acción mínima? No, no, no. O, o al principio del teorema de los trabajos virtuales? Es, bueno, la, sobre, sobre lo último, los trabajos virtuales no sé bien bien qué es. No, 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 no lo sé. Pero, por ejemplo, eh, bueno, entonces, recuperando la, la primera pregunta, es, eh, al fin y al cabo en física lo que hacemos es, toda la física se, eh, está relacionada con lo que se conoce como la acción. acción imagínate la acción como una, realmente es un funcional. ¿Vale? Un, menos técnicamente un, una, como una función donde toda la física, toda la física me refiero a cómo, cuál, cuál es la dinámica eh, de nuestro sistema encapsulada dentro de ese funcional. Entonces, tú, por ejemplo, Emilio Nether, que es una de las ideas más fantásticas eh, que hizo, bueno, que yo considero que hizo, es que él, 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 ella supuso una cosa, es que esa acción que es de mi física tiene que ser invariante bajo, cualquier, bajo una, transformación, una transformación infinitesimal de cambio de coordenadas. ¿Eso qué quiere decir? Que si yo, por ejemplo, cambio, you know, eh, si cambio, por ejemplo, una cambio a un pequeño desplazamiento en la variable de, de, de espacio, por ejemplo, eso no me, debe, no me debe afectar a la física. Entonces, a través de allí, se dio cuenta de que si eso es invariante, si la acción se mantiene invariante, simplemente con una técnica que es, para mí es súper sencilla, que es una interacción por partes, se dio cuenta de que obtenía una cantidad, una cantidad que se conservaba. Obtenía básicamente dos términos. Uno, que son las ecuaciones del movimiento que tú puedes derivar de la, de las, eh, del principio de mínima acción. Y la segunda es un término que, se, un término que es una derivada total de todos esos términos que tú has integrado por partes. Y lo más bonito de todo es que en ese momento, en ese punto, cuando tú aplicas las ecuaciones del movimiento, tú te das cuenta de que eso es una identidad, por lo tanto, eso tiene que ser igual a cero. Por lo tanto, todo lo que esté en el interior de la derivada total tiene que ser una identidad conservada. Entonces, si tú dices, mira, pues ahora eso es el caso más general, y ahora tú puedes decir, vale, pues, eh, ¿sabes qué? Me voy a aplicar diferentes simetrías. Por eso lo pienso yo como una máquina. Porque es tan general, bueno, Dentro de esta en general, que al fin y al cabo tú dices, mira, pues a partir de ahora que ya tengo la cantidad conservada, pues voy a coger, bueno, voy a coger que, por ejemplo, invariancia, invariancia sobre relaciones temporales, por ejemplo. Entonces cojo, eh, lo cojo, lo defino, lo meto dentro del teorema de, de, esa, de esa cantidad conservada y lo que, obtiendo, lo que obtengo es lo que se conoce como la, la función de energía. Y eso es lo que me describe la energía, de, de la, la energía total del sistema. Eh, entonces, entonces, la primera pregunta es, ¿se puede, si, se, ¿cómo se obtiene? Pues básicamente la idea es un cambio de coordenadas que me induce a un cambio, obviamente, de, de, de campos o de trayectorias y del propio, lo que se conoce, del propio Lagrangiano. Y segundo, es que no se puede derivar, bueno, las ecuaciones del movimiento se pueden derivar del principio variacional, eh, sí, pero eh, porque básicamente es el principio variacional, no, no creo que esto. Vale, no sé si he respondido a tu pregunta. Ahí ves a ver, Andreu. Ah, ah, vale, estás aquí. Ah, vale, hola, hola, hola. No, vale. Ah, sí, eh, ya vos entenc que el, sí. el teorema de Miller es básicamente un teorema matemático. Sí. Que, que demostra que la operación que, que mantiene ah, una, ah, una simetría continua es la mateix temps a la equivalencia a que la derivada de una magnitud es cero. Sí, sí, efectivamente. La idea es un poco es siempre que me encuentre, siempre que me encuentre una simetría continua en mi teoría, porque hay que decir una cosa, encontrar una simetría continua en una teoría, sobre todo porque cuando estamos hablando de teoría de cuerdas y teoría de gravedad unificada, es muy complicado, que ya de hecho, eso ya es un gran, es un gran paso. Pero una vez que tú tienes esto, 
tú lo que puedes es coger y porque esa, esa cantidad se conserva así, para cualquier, eh, cualquier cantidad conservada, tú lo puedes coger, hacer las transformaciones adecuadas para adaptarlo a tu problema y, y te da justamente el resultado que, que, que uno espera. De, de otra forma, por ejemplo, la, el momento angular o el, la conservación del momento, por ejemplo, la, 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 bajo de, de, la conservación de la energía, tú puedes derivarlo a través de una mecánica clásica. Por ejemplo, tú, por ejemplo, de alguna forma puedes hacer un poco de hand waving con, con las manos y, y derivarlo sin tener que utilizar el teorema de Kerr. Pero es que una de las cosas que a mí me sorprende, y aquí me voy a reír un poco más, es la, la forma sistemática en que uno consigue las cosas. Porque siempre que me encuentro una, una, una simetría continua, sea la que sea, sé que ya algo gracias al teorema de Kerr, de que ya lo que se va a conservar. Y eso lo puedo utilizar para simplificar mi, mi, mi problema. So, esa es la idea. Simetría continua me deriva, de, de alguna forma, me induce o se conecta con, con, con leyes de conservación. Vale, y te preguntaba, lo del principio de trabajos virtuales, para sí. que los otros de Timde, que trabajan mucho sí. con el método de la mente finita, hemos servido mucho el principio de trabajos virtuales o, de manera generalizada, el mm. operador de Petro Galentín. Ah, oh, ostras, pues no, no, no soy consciente de esto, no, no lo sé. Y me imagino que... Se da poder, poder relacionar el operador Petro Galerting a el teorema de Mileto. A ver, eso es en nuestro campo que es una simetría continua. De alguna forma, yo no, no sé cuál es el lenguaje, pero o sea, lo que comentar sí. es un principio matemático sí. por el cual que nosotros medio damos por hecho que sí. se cumple sí. y, y, y nos apoyamos en eso para, para ah, vale. nuestros métodos aproximados. Y... Vale, pues si, si eso es una simetría continua y es un operador, es un operador de alguna forma que representa una simetría. Eh, seguramente se podría utilizar el teorema de Nede para obtener cuál es la cantidad conservada, ¿sí? Si sí, es una simetría continua. Habrían de trobar la simetría continua. Seguramente sí que hay, ¿eh? pero habrían de trobar la simetría continua. Exactamente, es que la clave de todo, dice, bueno, Emi Nede, que bueno, para mí es una de las mentes más brillantes que, bueno, que he conocido, ¿no? que he leído, es que se dio cuenta de que obtuvo de manera sistemática el, el, la ley de conservación. Pero claro, el, el primer step que tenemos que hacer es encontrar esa simetría continua. Si una vez que lo consigamos, que para mí es very challenging, eh, lo obtener, es, es de manera sistemática. Por ejemplo, esto pasa en el interior. Vale, o sea, o sea, o sea, está claro en mí, o sea, es la, la intuición que yo tenía que trobar la simetría continua es, es difícil, muchas vagadas. Sí, 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 no, 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 es muy, muy, muy complicado. Muy complicado. Vale, vale no, lo digo porque si... Si, por ejemplo, en el caso de, del, del operador Petro Galerkin, que es la que se sí. ha hecho a que lleva continuamente sí. en, sí. en, en los finits, sí. si probéssim de manera sistemática o una sí. relación de quién es la simetría continua a la que sí. nos podemos referir, en muchos problemas que nosotros tenemos, podríamos aprovechar esta simetría que ya tendríamos identificada para resolver muchos problemas sí. que... Eh, yo, por ejemplo, a la media de tesis, me he hecho de cap fins que vaig resoldre de una otra manera, no me he de minete, pero también he una minimización molt de hand waving, si vols, sí. porque no, 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 estaba, no era molt massa rigurosa, pero sí que la intuición de ella ha de ser para aquí, ha de ser para aquí, sí. que vaig resoldre. Sí, sí, sí. sí. Pues si tenéis ese caso, sí que podéis tener el tema de minete para obtener, su, para obtener esa ley de conservación y simplificar vuestros problemas, sí, sí. Pero tenéis que encontrar la simetría continua. Sí. Vale, gracias. Vale, no. Gracias, pero Andreu, te, tenemos una pregunta por el chat que te la voy a leer. No, vale. Eh, mira, Carlos, tengo que esperar la pregunta. Quisiera saber si tienes simetrías discretas, por ejemplo, la que encuentras en cristales. No, no, vale. vale. Termino. ¿Se puede derivar alguna ley de conservación relacional para simetrías discretas no. y no continuas? No, la respuesta es no. Esto solamente sirve para simetrías continuas. Para discretas habría que, bueno, no, no se podría hacer. ¿no? O al menos las falas hay no. Obviamente a lo mejor puede haber algún caso muy particular, pero el teorema de Nether es muy claro en esto, que tiene que ser una simetría continua. Perfecto. Vale. Te agradezco. A ti. Vale, bueno. Una, sí. eh, al aplicar el teorema de Neder a sistemas no locales, ¿no podrías perder esta continuidad del No, de lo, de lo, de lo demostramos rigurosamente. Claro, ¿qué pasa? Con el teorema no locales, aquí hay, una, hay un trick muy, 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 que es una cosa que nos sentimos bastante orgullosos. Es que tú, una, una forma de derivar el teorema de Neder es una integración por partes. Al fin y al cabo, lo que haces es, bajo esa invariancia de la acción, ¿vale? ese cambio de coordenadas que, que induce toda esta invariancia, 
Eh, los siguientes pasos es integrar por partes, sacar los voluntary terms eh, de, nuestro, de nuestro sistema. ¿Qué pasa? Que eso en teoría es notable, porque tenemos operadores integrados diferenciales, no se puede hacer. O hay gente lo que hace, que es básicamente decir, mira, pues tengo por ejemplo el operador con producción, lo desarrollo en Taylor en una serie, una serie formal y de alguna forma, pero claro, desde un punto de vista matemático, desde un punto de vista físico es totalmente correcto, porque yo no, yo no diría nada. Pero ¿qué pasa? Desde un punto de vista matemático te estás encontrando con un problema de convergencia en series infinitas. O sea, si me pones una serie infinita donde no sé si me va a con, con, converger, ¿qué significado físico tiene cuando yo, por ejemplo, que al fin y al cabo tenemos que ir al experimento y tenemos que comprobarlo todo? Y si yo te digo, vale, pues el resultado es infinito. ¿Qué información voy a obtener ahí? No, 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 tiene, no tiene nada. Entonces, nosotros lo que hicimos es una, eh, fue un trick bastante guay que no, no, no utilizamos una integración por parte, lo hicimos de otra forma que era la misma estructura para la nación, para la bueno, para, para teoría son uh -huh. sí, sí. Pero no, no se mantiene todo. Encima, la analogía es muy clara cuando estás trabajando con teorías locales y con teorías locales, la analogía es muy clara. Entonces, estamos muy bien trabajando con eso. Mm. Gracias, Pues, si hay alguna pregunta más o comentario. ¿Estamos? Bueno, pues nada, gracias, Carlos. A pleasure. Gracias, Nos vemos en el próximo café de cine. Ok, thank you so much. Ah, perfecto. So thank you so much for here. This is the most important thing. <laughs>